So I just want to quote my father, Dick Johnson, and say how sweet it is to be here with the many collaborators on this film. And this is a film we made together with my father. And one of our operating principles was that we would try to look for the unseen things and the unseen perspectives. And so this sort of chance for all of us to talk together about what it took to make this movie um, is really meaningful, especially in this moment of the pandemic that sort of lets us all to be together, even when we can't be together. Now the question is, do you know which room you live in? Uh, yeah, I do. Where do you live? Right in this room here. Nicely done. Do you mind if I sit down? No, are you tired? Would you like this a little? Uh... No, leave it in, leave it in, leave it in. Thank you. I'm gonna sit down. Ah, oh, how sweet it is. Yes, indeed. You tired? Yeah, am I tired? My feet are like uh, concrete blocks. But, you know, my father was drifting away. Uh, the dementia was taking him away from me. And um, I'm gonna to toss it to you, Pete Horner. Uh, yeah, well, certainly it was, uh, it was a real collaboration with all of us and with your dad. And uh, I think we all kind of felt that uh, connection and wanted the audience to feel that connection with him. Uh, he, he's sort of the core and drives it all. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one thing we talked about early on. Um, we had a very early collaboration and we talked about uh, and explored with sound the idea of drift and connection to reality. And um, so a lot of the scenes play, you know, as verite and, uh, we, you know, we put in a lot of Foley so you would feel close to, you know, the, the tangible experience of it. But then other sections, we, we really looked for places where we could get into his subjective experience. Um, you know, of, of sort of drifting away and, you know, and so we use the sound to, to do that. Yeah, and you know, you see him here basically saying like, go ahead, you can kill me if you want, but just pass it by me before you do it, right? So that there's all these states represented. And Maureen, I know that you and I have talked a lot about the like, the range of cinema language we were trying to employ to connect to this, uh, changeling uh, dementia and what it was doing to my dad. Yeah, and I think this clip really shows the kind of two poles that we were working under, which is cinema magic and then also cinema verite. And so for instance, we have, we start with the floating chair, which is um, a green screen element with some special effects. We have stunts, we have special effects makeup, we have a car crash, high speed filming, which allows for the slow motion feel of it. Um, and the elongation of time. And then we end with that wonderful dance and music interlude. And I feel like in just this eight and a half minutes, we really get a sense of the whole range of what we were going for in this film. I mean, the line Nels that we always went back to was this idea of this film will teach us how to make it. And, you know, Maureen, like we didn't know we were gonna use all of those methodologies, but that was what ended up happening. Um, and, you know, I think Marilyn, you and Katie Chevigny on the production team constantly were pulling us back into why, why use this cinema language? What is this about now? What for? Um, so, you know, just to take us back to the euthanasia moment, um, tell us about the why that you were always pushing us towards. Well, I think this, you know, in the specificity, there was a universal storytelling. And so for me, you know, you would have these really poignant moments with your dad, which were probably normal conversation for you guys throughout your life, but where we get to glimpse and it, and it can be a kind of instruction manual for people. How do you have these difficult conversations? And I think when the film was able to both rise above itself, it was like entirely entertaining, but also rise above itself for this universal truth, I always felt really struck. Um, that the film would succeed. And I know in this scene also, we had the flip of that, which is, you know, first do no harm. DJ always has to be cared for in whatever state he was in. And I think as certain things in the film evolved, we started to realize 
are we are we skating too close to the line and therefore why still do it or or why pull it back and and show the audience that restraint too absolutely and like to stay committed to that we weren't going to force him to do anything he didn't want to do and he wanted it to be a funny movie i was struck when you said the word struck uh by the connection to sound and the fact of the thwack uh <laughs> the moment when the uh, board hits my father in the neck. Uh, Pete Horner, can you talk about the tone of that thwack? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, that's something that we worked on together a lot, both in that scene and, and in other scenes where there's the stunts. And, uh, you know, there's such a range of what you can uh, achieve in terms of how much pain you feel or how much, you know, comedy you feel or, you know, horror or whatever and it's all contained in you know which sound which frequencies you know what level um and it, it just took us you know going through a bunch of sounds together and deciding you know which is the most satisfying thwack for that moment but you know it's really i guess trying to connect us to his experience but it's also just acknowledging the the filmmaking process. I mean, we let ourselves get a little cinematic, a little, you know, Hollywood in places. And then other places we would just keep it, you know, very, very realistic. Yeah, I mean, what I'd learned from working with you on camera person was that I wanted sound mixing earlier in the process because what happens with sound is that you feel things in your body in, and you don't know until you hear it what you will feel. Um, and so that part of our experimentation was let's go in early and often to a sound mix that we can do and redo the way that you know editing happens. We re we do and redo things. Um, but I, Nels, I want to pass it to you because as you know from the beginning, I really wanted to get this story of what had happened to my mom with her mom's death into the film because I sort of felt like it was the heart of things because it has to do with the sudden death, the images that we see that we can never unsee um, and how do we cope with the loss um, over time having, you know, sort of lived through the most traumatic thing possible. Um, so maybe talk to us a little bit about that <laughs> in this movie and in this sequence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the film takes us through this journey fr from the, the very beginning. You have this idea, this kind of crazy idea. Let's film, you know, you killing your dad, your dad dying over and over. And it's it's in this sequence that the reason for that becomes clear. And I, I don't think it was clear to us when we started making the movie why that was why that was the idea. We knew it was a good idea, but we didn't know why until we kind of threw all these balls up in the air and had all these these emotions and, and these themes and symbolisms going on at the same time. And then when we discovered at this point that it was it was to get at that sense of loss for you and your dad and your mom all at the same time through cinema, that these moments all come together in in this one sequence. So you have you have death, you have stunts, you have comedy, you have sleep, you have heaven, you have all these things happening right here in in this in this central bit that took us a while to find but it but it's where it's where the film really begins to pay off the slow motion heaven was fascinating because you really really wanted to do slow motion high speed i think we ended up shooting at like at least 800 frames per second for for that sequence and many others on the stage and um it's it's something that's I, I kind of think a lot that it's used a lot in commercials, but your approach to using that was actually to extend a moment to kind of allow us to have that moment in and just really wallow in it. And it was very much a, like a lit motif for what you were trying to do in the making of this film with your father was to try to keep those moments longer than you knew they were gonna be possible. And it's funny that, you know, for me, I always think of it the reason why I wanted to use slow motion um, was that I wanted to enter my father's present, which seemed like it was, you know, his present was um, so intense because of the dementia and sort of like, how could I find a way to get into that space where you, 
you ask one question and then ask the same question right after the other. But I love what you're saying about how it's about lingering and savoring and holding on to something. Um, this sequence of the dance, you know, we made it without music to dance to because it was in slow motion. So it, there's a there's a lot of ways in this film that we reverse engineer things. We we do something and then we come back to it and figure out how to do it. So we actually wrote music to the dance after we had cut it. Um, the wonderful John Kimbrough wrote the music, but when we had finished it, I still, it was still not doing the things that I wanted it to do. And I came to the sound mix, Pete, with this just real wish that we go further. Um, so take it away. Yeah, I mean, I think the the song works so well for the, the joy and, um, you know, sort of uh, describing the energy of that moment. But I think, you know, you really wanted to push it to do more. Um, you know, and so we kept trying to, it, it did a good job of moving us, you know, through the scene in a really, you know, fun and energetic way. But I think you were really trying to get that feeling of the out of control moment and the car crash and all that. And, and that just wasn't present in it. And, and I remember we, we kept trying to, um, you know, I embraced the sort of, uh, with the blessing of the composer, the, you know, the remix idea and just, kind of went for it and broke it apart and put it back together and you know pitch shifted some things here and there um but I remember there was it, but I'm always trying to do it in a very musical way because that's my instinct you know and I remember you kept pushing me to say I really want it to like break and I want it to break like right here and you pointed to a you know a frame or whatever and it it felt very unmusical to break it there. And so it, it went against sort of my core instincts, but I, I just trusted you and I was like, okay, let's just, let's break it. And it was quote unquote wrong, but it also like revealed how we, how we break it and then put it back together. And, um, you know, the only other thing I'll say about it is that it just felt like anytime we could do something that acknowledged a subtle moment in the image, it, it just drew meaning out of it, you know, um, whether it's the, the little bells or the, um, you know, the, uh, the look on your dad's face with the car crash, like it, there's, there's so many little details that we could attach a sound to the, the clarinet playing, just making sure that that was featured when he was on screen playing. All of that was so satisfying. And I, I, I felt like we found the meaning, the deeper meaning in it. I love what you're saying about like how wrong that moment was, you know, dementia yeah. is so wrong. Death is so wrong. Yeah. And part of my wanting to, to break things in the unexpected moment was to replicate for the audience, this effect that dementia creates this sort of whiplash of having wrong things happen at the wrong moment. And, and, and the person you love most and know most suddenly saying something to you that makes no sense and completely blindsiding you. Um, so it's interesting how often I hear myself saying, I, I wanna break things. Um, you know, like that, that this film that I was trying to kill my dad and break things. And like, in some ways, you know, this just like sort of defiance of dementia and defiance of death, um, was what we we struggled with in the edit room the whole time, right, Nels? Like we were we and when you look at this sequence, it's completely out of chronological order, um, and none of these scenes um, needed to be there until they did. Yeah, I mean, even that that interview, that beautiful interview with your dad, that was relatively late in in the process, and he's very clear in that moment. And this is the thing with with real dementia is you do have moments of clarity and moments of, of, of opacity, and I think you know the film sort of adopts exactly that that approach. It's that that it can jump at any minute from beautiful to to broken to funny to tragic, um, yeah. Yeah, that, that scene is always so amazing to me because he looks so youthful to me there. He looks so young and alive in that shot. Um, and it was deep, deeper into his dementia than a lot of the film. So I think you're exactly right that the film in its structure um, echoes dementia. But I would also add for all the things that are broken, you know, that were broken in this, 
one of the things your dad did that is my favorite shot of the whole film is when we were filming the heaven scene and they were dancing and he kind of took his mask off, even though he wasn't necessarily supposed to take his mask off. So he could get this full glimpse of his young bride in a way he hadn't seen her and yet must have been familiar, right? Um, I just, I love that it's in the cut. I love that he did it, even though we were in the middle of shooting a dance number. Like, it's just, the, I feel like for all we asked of your dad, these were the gifts of the, of the film. So this sort of one thing leading to another is what this film is all about, I would say. But trying to embrace not just breaking things, not just crying about things, but also being playful, trying to figure out how does comedy work, <laughs> trying to figure out how to laugh in the face of the most painful things. All of that was part of the craft that, you know, every person on this team brought to the process.